Um, hi, everybody. This is the last uh, unconference session on track two. Um, there'll be more on track one after this, but I'm joined with I'm joined by the four people who've done the last talks on this track. Um, I've got Luke, who uh, talked about his uh, upcoming package um, campaign builder. I had Leon, um, who's talked about um, Braco as an enterprise platform. Um, Sophie, who introduced us to the Nexa storefront accelerator. And Paul, who talked about a sustainable marketing technology operating system. Um, very interesting talks. Thanks very much, all. Um, collected together a few questions, um, a few specific ones, but I think we'll also probably just touch on a few themes that I think some of your, uh, your talks um, all kind of overlap to some extent with. Um, so I'll just do the specific ones to get those out of the way first. I mean, the first was for, for you, Luke. Um, sure. what, what was very impressive um, to myself, and I could also see in the chat, was um, just what a nice looking integration you had in the back office. It looked very umbraco. Um, and it, it was just a question about the what UI library you used to put that together, in particular the kind of data flows interface. I don't know if you could share the details of that. Yeah, sure. I think we used, uh, I think it was a jQuery flow library. I don't know the exact one. Um, we had to customize it quite a bit because it was quite basic, um, but it gave us the idea and it gave us the base of what we wanted to replicate. Um, I think we we took a lot of inspiration from flow builders that, that you get in uh, dot mailer and and uh, mailchimp and things like that to really kind of visualize a campaign flow okay thanks and the, the other specific question of your talk was just just why why content apps i think you touched on this in your in your talk but but why are you particularly focused on that part of the Umbraco integration and not a custom dashboard or some of the things that have been in, in the product for a bit longer? Yeah, sure. I think it was uh, it was a combination of things. A, we wanted to use a content app for something, so we were we were really kind of driving to to ha have a content app for something. Um, but ultimately, we were finding that the 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 people that were building these campaigns were marketing people and they wanted to closely relate their landing page or their competition page or something with their uh, with their campaign and how their campaign was performing. So they didn't want to have to go uh, to the page, to the node, create the content and then go off to a custom dashboard to find the campaign that was linked to it. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we started with this whole idea of having a campaign automatically available off the side of a, of a content page, basically, which from a content editing perspective, they absolutely love. Yeah, so it's all about making it easier for them to find the information yeah. they need. And it, it does fit in nicely with that. Yeah. That's Nice. Okay. So, so yeah. So, one of the things I thought that came across from from all of your talks was this the kind of decision around sort of build versus buy, to put it really simply, um, whether to kind of you know build functionality yourself or or product that you can use for that. So, I mean, I'll, I'll start with you, Luke, because um, it, it struck, struck me probably eighteen months ago when you started this product that that was potentially quite a difficult decision you had because you you kind of made it to say. It'll be great. It'll all be within Umbraco. We can just log in. It'll all be there. Yeah. But you kind of had this little con saying, "But we've got to build all this stuff." Yeah, basically. Um, was that a difficult decision back then? Because yeah, um, the, pro the product now looks amazing. But before you built it, I imagine that must have been a little, quite a few um, discussions you had with the client around whether to to go that route. Yeah, completely. And we had a great client in terms of they. It was up to us how we did it. They just were interested in the end product, um, and I think that's probably kind of what swayed us into building it all ourselves. Um, so we we obviously took a lot of inspiration from from other products, but from from the early kind of prototypes, we just couldn't replicate that seamless kind of user journey by having two separate systems, mm -hmm. um, even with. Yeah, uh, all, all the API integrations into something like Dot Mailer, mm -hmm. um, there was still that disconnect. Um, so we probably spent a long time trying to connect the two systems um, before we then decided to to actually give it a go and build it ourselves. And don't get me wrong, it took a lot longer building it ourselves. Um, and we will probably never be able to replicate the uh, the capabilities of something like Dot Mailer. Um, but we wanted that seamless uh, kind of approach from a, from a UI and a user perspective. Um, and that's been the, the biggest kind of achievement out the back of it, I suppose. Yeah, I guess it's, I mean, to, to say you're going to replicate the whole of Dot Mailer was obviously never going to be on the table. But yeah. if you can replicate enough of it or you know, the, the, the functionality you actually need, then that then works quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Leon, you're, 
you and your company are probably a little bit further along the, the route that Luke's going on now in the sense that, I, as I understand you, Marketing Suite was something that you initially started to build for clients for particular products, sorry, particular projects, but now you're spinning this off obviously as a product that other developers can then use to, to not have to reinvent this wheel. Is that kind of how you see you, where your Marketing Suite fits in? Yeah, I, I guess. Um, <clears throat> we started off with functionalities and we started adding functionalities in each project. And also within the community, we, we showcased some of the functionalities, also the personal personalization based on implicit parameters. We showed back in 2017. And the first questions we got was, uh, can you turn this into a package? And back then, this was uh, one of our first implicit based personalization projects. So we thought we can never put this into one package mm -hmm. because it has to support all those different strategies, all those different content structures. I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. but then we also showed it to our own customers and they said, this is what I want. And so we, we started building it for other customers. And then we realized we can actually make a package out of this. Um, and somewhere down the road, we also decided we need to make a package out of this because the, we always think that technique should never be a hurdle. It should be there. Um, and what we see is with our clients and also with other agencies I talk with by uh, Marketing Suite, mm -hmm. uh, through U Marketing Suite, is that it's always about uh, what are we going to do? So more about the strategy and the technique should, uh, should uh, support it. So that's where we said, well, let's make it a package, put it in there and talk about strategy and not about the technique. And uh, if the technique is that good, it will also inspire marketers, editors to start actually using personalization, uh, A-B testing, uh, start playing around with pro with profiles, building segments on top of that. So it's more, we got more and more experience. Customers started asking it. Uh, uh, the community started asking uh, for a package and we were more focusing on strategy than on technique, at least I was. So that's when I said, just put it in there and let me focus on strategy and not on writing down all things we have to build for making implicit personalization happen yeah okay and and sophie is it a similar story for, for you in the sense that you, you've obviously got a lot of history or your company's got a lot of history and you personally with with e-commerce and now you're yes. bringing that towards you know a package that people can buy into and use um without having to kind of re-implement all the the basic e-commerce functionality themselves Exactly. So we were uh, a little bit in the similar situation, but it's a little bit different as well. Uh, I would say, as I said uh, during the talk as well, this uh, was very much, we had thought about it before. And me as a former e-commerce manager is always this quite tricky. Should you go with something like out of the box that already exists or should you go something larger that you can grow into? But we didn't find this middle way where we can actually buy into something that you can continuously grow with, basically. So, so when we um, came into the pandemic and we got so many requests of setting up huge, um, huge uh, solutions quite fast, mm -hmm. and everyone wanted them to be done in like a month. Uh, and that's basically, I mean, you can do it, but it's not always the best uh, way to do it. And then we realized that many of these e-commerce solutions that we have built, they are quite similar in many ways. So that's also why we said that, okay, we, we, we can actually create something that we can become a cap package. And then after that, we can make our customers adapt this in any way they want. And also, that's like, as I said, today, this is built on Umbraco and Storm, but it could just as easily be Umbraco and something else in the future, basically. Yeah. Okay, so, so you're able to kind of give that flexibility. I guess that's one of the trade-offs with this buy versus build is if we build it, we can build it exactly how we want it. Um, yeah. And sometimes when you, when you you buy something off the shelf, you do have to follow, I think Paul mentioned this, you have to kind of follow how um, that particular product works. But you, you, you're able to kind of um, find that right balance, I take it, between something that can be very specific for a customer, but also not have to reinvent the wheel, as I say. 
Exactly. And I think that was what we aimed for and also for a way for them to be able to be cost efficient. And also, I mean, with the pandemic, many ones were taking huge risk in setting up uh, big solutions fast, not knowing how much ROI they would get back. And me coming from the business side, I understood this quite well, because when you're uh, sitting there on the other side, uh, checking every cost against what you're actually getting in there, it's uh, a little bit more of a risk. So we wanted, as I said, also to offer such a low risk as possible, but still to get all the basic basic functionalities that you might need. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's, um, don't tell you. yeah, so in, in our, our, I mean, we're not coming at it from a package side, of course, because everything we do is just internally, but certainly that's it. We look for, for example, the using intercom as our messaging and sort of user, you know, measuring user engagement. Um, it's really good at that. So we didn't want to have to rebuild that piece of it. We just figured out a way to integrate. And then there's parts of things that Intercom couldn't do like this goofy thing where they wanted to send it 15 hours, you know, after the prior message, which I just thought was ridiculous, but it actually works. I can't believe it. Um, so go figure. But so we, but we can enable those sorts of things, right, that you can't do in a third party tool, as long as that tool has a way to let you do that. Mostly that's via APIs these days. Um, but certainly that's, it's it's always a fine line, right? Between we should just build this all because we get exactly what we want, or we should let a tool do the parts that it's good at. You have to kind of understand it too. So there's some investment up front and understanding what the capabilities are. Yeah, and I thought Paul from your talk, it was kind of clear that even within a single project, you're making that pragmatic choice for different features. So yeah. you used you skinned because that got you off the ground quickly for for setting up the the site theme but yet you've certainly not shied away from doing custom builds where it's necessary for the reviews feature that you were showing there so what, what sort of factors do you look at when you're kind of weighing up um yeah uh, i mean in our business just because we don't have you know more than 10 million dollars in revenue we have to a lot cost is a big factor a lot of times so sometimes we'll scope a project i'll go to proworks and they'll you know they'll give me the the uh, estimate on it i'm like okay well we can't do that so then we start working backwards a little bit which i think is probably pretty common between client and agency right you're just sort of negotiating over what you can do what you can't and then uh beyond just the pure pragmatics of how much does it cost um there is is it something we can do with the tools we already have? Say, if our, I, I believe if more of our websites are on Embraco 8, we would probably be utilizing content apps more readily, but the majority of them are on version seven, so that's not really an option. So we're building things like dashboards, and, you know, custom property editors, things like that. Uh, but uh, last thing I'll say about this, so as not to take too much time is, the flexibility in Embraco is something I highlighted a lot in my talk is that is like the feature for us. That's why it's so valuable because we, you know, with, with our Embraco knowledge, we can literally like in an evening drinking a glass of wine, you know, we can kind of put together something that looks like what we were just talking about in our afternoon meeting. And the next day I can present it to my team and be like, is it kind of like this? And then, right, it's, you have this very quick iteration, like just even over a few days that it would be much harder if say you were using a HubSpot or a Salesforce where you have to like kind of have their whole special uh, language and development environment. And yeah, so anyhow, that's, that's how I approach it. And mm -hmm. um, as much as possible, I like to use, I guess the term is best of breed tools. Uh, but lots of times they're, you know, that won't exactly match, and that's when we'll actually bring something internal uh, to build. And and those those videos are, you know, those have been a little bit updated since I made those, of course. But um, that was the initial kind of prototype for what they look like. Yeah. Yeah. And then I mean, moving on from from prototypes, one thing I wanted to talk to to both Leon and Luke about with that they've clearly made a lot of effort to make their products fit with Umbraco. I mean, it, it looks like it's it's the you know the right colors, it's the right styles. Um, I guess two questions. What one, why why is that important to you and why do you make that effort? And and two, have you got any tips for how you how you make that work um, without becoming a maintenance headache uh, moving forward? I don't know which one of you wants to jump in. Should I start? <laughs> Go on, uh, like mentioned, we want actually customers to start using it. So and the customers are already familiar with how Umbraco works. So if we went really uh, vanilla flavor uh, regarding Embraco, then people recognize functionalities and are not afraid to start using it because they are also not afraid of start, starting using Embraco. Mm -hmm. So 
then you will end up using A-B testing with split view and uh, all those kind of functionalities because it's all familiar for you. Um, so we spend a lot of time and effort on making it as vanilla as possible. Um, just so that uh, people will start use, uh, to use it. Yeah, I think ours was exactly the same. Is that the, the 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 whole reason we wanted to build rather than buy was was to have one system. And if we styled it completely differently, um, then it would have felt like two systems, and and we didn't want that. Um, we wanted this to feel just like a, the, another part of Umbraco. So we've got some content editors that have never used Umbraco before, and they think this is part of Umbraco, and that's exactly what we want. Um, mm -hmm. So I think from a styling perspective, we, we there was no um, kind of clear documentation or UI library on, on, on elements to use. So we kind of had to pick our way around and, and pull bits out, um, which Ended up perfectly fine, uh, but there wasn't there wasn't a, a base to work from. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it, it got there. Um, we are we are we have kind of updated the UI since some of these screenshots, um, it, basically to bring it more in line with with um, Braco moving forward. Yeah, and I guess. I, um, sorry, I, I, no, I, I, I hope you just follows on. You may go on to and you say first. I've also seen a lot of uh, examples on. Uh, projects where, where clients were actually coming from EpiServer or Sitecore. And uh, as you might know, EpiServer is just buying big piece, pieces of company of, or pieces of functionality, add it into their solution, and then they have their own suite. But if you start using it, you really feel like jumping from one project to the other project. Mm -hmm. and it's not really integrated. Yeah. That, that is not the UX that we should aim for, I guess, because then you really have to start people learning systems, giving tutorials, and we don't want that. We, we really want to inspire people not to be afraid to really start using those functionalities without having to undertake a, uh, a four-week uh, course or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Simply start using it. I expect you both, and well, all of you, will have seen some of the, the talks about um, the new back office mm -hmm. um, and the web components. Um, I, I guess the, the question is, are you, are you looking forward to that or are you dreading it? Because on the one hand, I can see you're going to have quite a bit of work to update your packages to, to, to match that. But on the other hand, it should make it easier moving forward in the sense that y you won't be relying on kind of undocumented classes and things that might change between different versions. Yeah, I think from from my perspective, kind of building something so kind of integrated and closely coupled to Embraco ultimately means that uh, that we've got to keep up with their rate of development. Um, so that's just part of the challenge, unfortunately. Um, so, it, but it's exciting. It's uh, It kind of gives us more opportunities, I suppose, moving forward, which is just what we want. Yeah, and also yeah, and, mm. oh, sorry, Leon, go ahead. Also for us, because also V9, of course, coming up, uh, that's also a big piece. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I actually believe that uh, we launched today that uh, we uh, have made public that we got it up and running. So your marketing suite is actually running on V9. Up front, we thought this, this will be a hell of a job. But when we actually started doing uh, development, we saw, okay, this is going to work out pretty nice. And also for any back office, because uh, I, when you mentioned it, I already saw my front-enders and designers starting yes we can actually this new functionality uh, yeah. within, within the, the suite because it's always down on the backlog and now we can take it on top so yeah of course that's that's the thing when you start building a, a suite and package based upon a, a cms we should always follow the cms but we can also benefit from the cms of course so yeah. it's two-way uh, street yeah um paul you wanted to come in on something I was just going to say, um, I think there's a lot of excitement, not only with package and commercial vendors, but but with companies that use them, Rock was kind of central to their marketing operation, which is, I mean, that's, without that, we don't really have a business. And that's true for most folks, I think, because with the things like the, the components coming in, it makes, it just makes it easier to work with, right? And then you don't have kind of pink over here and blue over here. And then it's just so much quicker. Uh, 
to work with and my then my teams get the experience of having things that look similar to like what Luke and Leon have done where it looks like the same thing, but I don't have to invest all that effort to make sure that, because it's not easy, right? In current Umbraco to make it look like the back office. There's, it's a concerted effort. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's all, just a comment on that. Yeah, that's definitely true. <clears throat> and, and Sophie, we, we were talking just a little bit before we started about how these decisions, they're never, there's never one right or wrong, wrong one, but that you, you take different um, take different routes depending on what works for your products. and. And for next to storefront, you, you very much focus more on saying, okay, Umbraco is going to do the CMS and Storm Commerce is going to be the back end for managing commerce. And we'll pull those all together in a headless fashion. So can, can you talk a little bit about why you kind of went went that route? Well, basically why we went that route is that we found that they matched uh, match each other quite well. So we got both of what we needed from the both solutions. We also made this combination quite a few times before and they've all been quite successful. So that's also why we said that this is probably the way we want to go for the storefront. But it's also, as we said, we also built this in order to be flexible if there, for example, is uh, a client who is uh, requesting some other backend than, than what we have today. So it's, it's absolutely flexible to change this in the future as well. For now, we haven't, but uh, who knows? And I think also this is like what we're saying now and, and when new things are coming in and, and uh, V9, it's this is changing all the time. So I think that if you're building a solution that is uh, unflexible, I think that will be quite hard for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the themes about sort of flexibility we've been seeing in the industry a lot is this kind of separating out things into their components. So headless is obviously a, been a big thing in the, in the last few years. Um, also, I mean, Paul, you, you talked about using um, kind of Azure functions and uh, mm-hmm. logic apps to kind of separate off um, bits of bits of functionality. Um, could, could, could you say just a little bit about how, well, why sure. you kind of chose that route? Because sometimes yeah, it's easier to say well, it's just building. I think it's strictly know. that. Uh, I'm sorry, Andy. I didn't no, no, go on. cut you off there at the end. <laughs> I should I should learn to finish my questions. Please go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say I think it's just a matter of, of choosing what what's best at what we wanted it to do, which was to just keep running forever, basically these functions, which are what they're really good at. And we use a variety of them, right? I mean, I don't want to promote functions necessarily, but they can run on a timer, or they can you can send a webhook to it, and it can kick off. There's a lot of different ways you can use it. And to us, it made a lot of sense because. Uh, well, one is we already had a pretty heavy Azure investment with for our internal bespoke apps that we have. So we we have a lot of Azure. I mean, you look at our, so adding in some more function apps wasn't a big deal, and um, we didn't want to be tied specifically to Umbraco as kind of the engine that runs our automation side of things. And it, it, you can do that with Umbraco, of course, but um, we feel that we felt that function apps was a better fit. And then the last thing I'll say is uh, with the with Microsoft introducing the idea of logic apps, which is kind of like Zapier, but for developers, right, is we were able to very quickly do some integrations. And that was my point about we wanted to be able to try a lot of different things without incurring a lot of cost in the process. And so using a logic app, we were able to do these integrations like not exactly by dragging and dropping, but as close to that as you can get. Um, so we weren't investing a lot of money in letting the team try something for a month while we were on the trial. And that was an important piece to us because like I said, we didn't really know what we needed. We had, we didn't know. So we wanted to try things and see what kind of fell out. Anyways, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Luke, you, you sound like you've gone on a similar route in the sense that you started trying to build stuff within Umbraco and then you moved to Hangfire and now you're moving out of the web application completely into another processes. Yeah. Exactly that. I think we started by trying to have it all in, in, in within Umbraco, um, but from a scalability perspective, certainly more recently where we're, we're talking millions of, of, of records flying around and, and transactions and stuff, um, having all that load was, was affecting the website. So um, ultimately, we, we started to want to separate it all out. I think the early days, it was all about cost. It was all about trying to reduce the, the cost to bring the product or bring the idea to market. And once we knew that it works, it was now, right, how do we scale this? And let's start pulling it apart a bit more. So. Um, yeah, because of cost was such a big driver in the early days, we didn't go down that route day one. Yeah, understood. Yeah, makes sense. 
Okay, um, so the last question I've got, which it was directed to you, Leon, but I think it's probably something that all four of you will be able to, to chip in on. So um, the question was, how do we think as a community, and I think I'll add in as, and as HQ as well, how, how do you think we as a community in HQ can bring Umbraco to the next level, making it a real competitor to the bigger CMSs like Sitecore, Kentico, EpiServer, et cetera? So Leon, you've touched on this a, a little bit already in um, comparing the way Umbraco does things versus um, some of these other products. Um, how, how do you think Umbraco can up their game to um, to compete with these players? Well, I think, um, first of all, like I mentioned in my talk also, if you go to the Umbraco.com website, then you will see we are a CMS supplier. So there is that, that is where, where the journey starts, of course, for our customers. So, uh, and I think as, as we talk over here, this is the real situation. So we should focus on best of breed. And again, all uh, packages can be part of best of breed, I guess. Uh, but for some people uh, making use of uh, your marketing suite, for instance, is their best of breed uh, approach, or they are really focusing on one package. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, I guess, Umbraco.com really has to support uh, the story. And the story is, is, is uh, has multiple levels, but right now you know, we are focusing on industries, and that's a good thing because because uh, clients can recognize themselves in, in solutions that have already been made. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the package uh, store or, or shop where, uh, what's uh, upcoming is also a good thing, but it's more about uh, that's more technical, and like I said. Uh, technique should never be a hurdle. We can do everything as long as you have got the ideas. So I think we also have to ins inspire customers based on upon ideas and success stories because they will uh, recognize the success stories and they will say that is exactly what I need. That is what I want. No hassle, simply make use of Umbraco, connect it to whatever. It looks simple. Uh, I, I, I can read that editors and marketers are using it, they are fond of it. That is exactly what I want. And then the technique becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and that is what we should focus on and not on, uh, because of course, and, and, and it's, it's a good thing because Umbraco has a large community of developers, but uh, developers are not always selling Umbraco. So I think we, should also have a focus on more st strategical level to inspire marketers, digital strategists, uh, whoever is in the digital domain to say, we've got the technique, we've got the success stories, we can do this for you also. So come with your story, we will help you out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, really, you anything to add to that? Yeah, please. Yeah, I really, I really agree with you there, Leon, because I, what I always say is that technology should work for you and not the other way around. Right. Because what I've noticed quite a lot in my in my role back in the days is also that sometimes you, you're new in a team or you get new people in, in a team and they need to be up and learning this quickly. And what I also like about Umbraco there is that you get so you get in it fast, it's, it's uh, stable and it's easy to learn and people are getting quite fond of it quite fast. And I also see that with my clients today, it's something that it's easy to use, it's easy to understand, and it always gets out so well in the end. So I think that um, this is also a really good example for when technology is working for you. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have to wind up actually, so I think we could carry on talking this for a long time. But, um, <laughs> I shall sure. certainly enjoy the discussion. But uh, yeah, yeah I think you. we need to wind up. Um, we're finishing up on track two, I believe now. So all the sessions now will carry on on track one for at least another few hours. Um, just want to give a last thanks to the four of you for fantastic talks. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of Coke on everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. A lot. See you all. Bye. 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 Bye.